ආරක්ෂිතලි වේදනය හදිසි අවස්ථාවකදී අනතුරු හැඟවීමේ නලාව නාද වීමට කටයුතු කිරීමට පිටක තහවීමට කොළපැති සම්පන්න we all know literal bang with guns going off in the face of elephants and you know our work is cut off with all the recent conversations on leopards and the challenges we've been having so if we thought that uh, you know we get some breathing space this year it certainly doesn't look like it so things don't look easier don't look like they're getting better but it will just mean that we'll have to fight much much harder as we go along uh, thanks to all those uh, sponsor partners who got the show going that was classic jetwing will part to safari camp and wild coast yala uh, they've been our travel and accommodation partners for sahil's uh, visit here and uh, so we are fortunate to have them as usual we have a constant corporate sponsors in tb who support us on the lectures and the walks and varna and all of that and um, classic i know is also having some uh, special discounts and things on the safaris you saw some lovely majors earlier so i think rajiv and team have some um, information outside there you can grab someone uh, or you can check out the brochure and uh, you might find it interesting right uh cj and the sarva team who do our usual com comms uh thanks to them and of course uh, we'll enjoy some dilma tea later on in the day right series of corporate partners uh, we have more hopefully coming on uh, this year we have a number of interesting conversations going on but we wouldn't forget our constant partnerships with ntb ndb sampath bank uh, mr ajit adil costa tj brandix uh, jkoa and abans <coughs> so uh from a merchandising point of view we still need your money so we have lots of stuff out there the tiles the loris magazines t-shirts and things like that every every meeting we have quite a few people who pick up some of this but uh please help us out by picking up more uh so that you know we can use that money back into conservation right um number of people have been asking what's coming up so just to tell you again uh, like i've been sharing before the intensity of the number of activities going on is much much higher uh, i'm just back from a lovely trip to mana there's a number of people in the audience who were on that trip and we had a wonderful time but uh, we have more happening um, there's a cat chat for those of you who are interested in cat research and things like that that's happening on the 18th at 3:30 by invitation to a number of people who are in that community that's at the head office uh 19th at 5 o'clock we are up in candy rukshan who's here is doing a lecture on leopard behavior and uh, that's happening with the british council uh, so please uh, talk to your friends and family and people who are in that vicinity because this is yet another commitment we've been having and making that we will get out conservation messages and workshops and things all over the country and uh, we are starting off with a repeat uh, uh, session in kandy which is uh, going to be quite interesting uh, the following week marine as you know we've got uh, going with the marine subcommittee and uh, driven by graham and a small team very active and rex is uh, again at the head office uh, we have usually about 20 to 25 people that we take and that's going to be on um, uh, part of the marine chat that we're having at head office next week 25th right couple of you asking us uh, what's happening with the field trip agenda you may have seen some slides but the shorter term uh, dates feb 8th and 9th singharaja right now again i don't need to remind you our field trips get booked up pretty fast and we don't take too many people so 
uh, please uh, make sure you're registering if you're interested in that. Uh, we're doing a second trip in Feb. That's to Mana. Uh, sorry, that's to Kalpitiya, right? So again, we are moving um, into uh, marine area as well. It's a day excursion. Um, so that should also be interesting for quite a few people. So we have two excursions next month, Kalpitiya and Singharaja, right? So um, new members, we keep getting uh, you know, a decent number. We saw quite a few last year, but I'm sure I see a couple of faces in the audience who are probably not on our membership database, and we'd love you to come and join us and you know, partner with us. Um, yeah, so the bungalows are there, as we know. Udabalave and uh, Vilpatu renovated and things like that. So quite a few of you have been patronizing those bungalows. Thank you very much. And uh, please join us for lots more work this year. We have, again, a fairly ambitious action planned, action packed year, right? So we are averaging between four and six activities each month, in addition to a lot of work we are doing on the scientific side and the conservation side and the legal side. But there's a huge mounting battle that we will have to wage judging by the fact that it's our own wildlife minister who's handing out guns to uh, uh, prevent uh, elephant challenges. So we have internal and external challenges to deal with. And so it's going to be a tough, challenging year. Uh, please join us. But as always, like we tell you, please do your own part. Conserve what you can and fight the battle in whichever capacity and uh, angles that you can. And that would be really appreciated. So we have a full house. And please get your mobile phones on silent as uh, I invite Graham to do a, sh do a short introduction. Uh, Sahil, as you know, has been flown down specially for this by WNPS. So this is, again, another commitment that we've been making to try to bring you know, maybe a speaker a year, because that's not a cheap exercise. But we'd like to bring some quality conversations and broaden the perspectives of what conservation uh, angles are being used all over the world. So Graham, do a short intro, and we'll get on to the plan for the day. Thank you, Sriyan, for allowing me to introduce uh, what I see this amazing personality. Dr. Sahil Nihajwan has an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, a master's degree in wildlife conservation, science, and policy, an advanced diploma in Spanish, and a PhD in anthropology. His career spans a non-profit sector, farming, and academia. For more than a decade, he has conducted multidisciplinary research on human wildlife locations in Latin America, Southern Africa, and South Asia, incorporating his training into physical, natural, and social sciences. His PhD innovatively combined ecological and anthropological approaches to study an, a newly identified population of tigers living in the community forest of northern India. He speaks six languages, including the endangered language of the Idu Mishmi people of northeast India, and a fewer than 10,000 speakers, with a fewer than 10,000 speakers. He is currently a research fellow at the University College London, UCL, and a British Academy fellow at the Zoological Society of London. Sahil is working with the local Idu Mishmi people to create new collaborative and ethical approaches to wildlife conservation and, and development. Over to you, Sahil. Thank you so much, uh, WNPS, for having me. It's really an honor to be here and to share my work with a room full of people in a country that, doesn't, uh, that I usually don't spend much time in. This is actually my first time in Sri Lanka. Um, so I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. And it's a story that revealed itself to me over the years, piece by piece. It's a story of tigers and shamans and priests and spirits and politics and development. Like any good story, it has its heroes and its villains. But more importantly for me, I think it's an incredible story because it taught me how to look at wildlife conservation differently. And my hope today is that there will be a message for everybody in this room uh, in the story, not just about wildlife conservation, but how to 
understand different relations between people and nature. Is everything fine? Yeah. yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, right, I'm going to jump right in. Um, well, I want to start by introducing Sipa Melo, the man on the screen. Um, Sipa Melo is an Idu Mishmi from the Bang Valley region of northeastern part of India. I call him Naba Sipa, lovingly. Naba means father in Idu language. Naba Sipa is a shaman. Uh, there is about 40 shamans left in the Idu Mishmi community, so he's quite rare. A shaman is similar to the Hindu priest or the Buddhist monks, but still quite different because not only do they, because they have to speak between the world of the people, so the human world, and the world of the spirits, and the world of the animals. But what makes Navasipa really, really special is that he's also a tiger. Idus believe that shamans, some of them, not all, are shape-shifting tigers. It's, his power comes from the tiger, and he uses that power to protect his people from the very powerful and bad spirits that haunt the mountains of the Bang Valley. Now, it's stories like these that has kept me in the Bang Valley. But it wasn't him that took me to the Bang Valley. What took me there was this, the tiger. OK. Um, most of you probably know the state of the tigers in the wild, but I'm going to still quickly go over it. They're not doing well. They're doing terribly, actually. We've lost about 97% of the tigers from the wild. Um, four out of nine species have gone extinct. We currently believe that there is fewer than 4,000 individuals left. In India, which uh, has the largest tiger population in the world, um, tigers are protected in discrete areas. Um, oh, there. Um, in discrete areas called the, the special reserves that are made for tigers. Once tigers are found in an area, uh, that area is typically declared a tiger reserve. That, it then begins a process of handing over that land to the government so it can be managed by the state and the NGO actors. Any humans that live on that land are then removed and their participation is curtailed. Now, this method, which is called exclusionary, exclusionary conservation, has produced fantastic results for tigers in some areas. In the south here, in the center here, and some parts of the north there, uh, tiger numbers have doubled. They have come back. But it hasn't been a rosy story overall. In 2006, and then again in 2009, two of very high-profile tiger reserves in the country entirely lost its tigers. Right under the nose of the, of the authorities, the tigers were poached clean of the reserves. A lot of other reserves also lost a considerable population of tigers. In this region, the northeastern part of the country, um, the tigers in the reserves are fairly rare. And there's a lot of tiger reserves that do not have tigers currently. So when I arrived in the Northeast in about 2011, um, the tigers were not doing well. At that time, we thought there were fewer than 3,000 individuals in the wild. But the Northeast is quite different. I'd never been there before. Uh, it's different from the rest of the country. The rest of the country, the green stuff that you see, the forest, is owned primarily by the forest department or some department of the government of, of India. In the Northeast, which is inhabited by hundreds and hundreds of different ethnic communities. The forest belongs to the communities. And so my, I was sent there uh, by the NGO I used to work for in New York at that time uh, to look for tigers in what seemed green on the map, but we had no information on their whereabouts. We didn't know what really lived in these forests. So that's how I uh, got to the Northeast. Um, my area was the state of Arunachal Pradesh. And I was sent to the Bang Valley, which at the, that point I did not know anything about. I was sent to the foothills to look for tigers. And um, I did surveys. Um, I spoke to people. Every time I spoke to the elders in the community there, 
They told me I was wasting my time, that I will not find any tigers in the plains, as researchers had told me that I should. They told me that if I had to find tigers, I should go up on the tallest mountains and look for tigers there, because in their culture, that's where the tiger lives, because it was sent to live there. I didn't really quite understand or believe a lot of those stories. Um, I used to work for a fairly large conservation NGO, and I'd gone to school to study wildlife conservation. I knew that tigers were a conservation-dependent species that lived in areas, especially if there were lots of tigers, in, an er in areas that were protected by governments and NGOs, such as the one that I worked for. The entire area of the Bang Valley was not a tiger reserve. There were no park guards. Um, it was about 400 kilometers as the crow flies from this area, Kaziranga, which was the nearest tiger population, a tiger reserve. So I didn't really pay too much heed to the, to the, to the stories that the elders were telling me. But it did take seat in my head. So a year later, in 2012, I returned. And I asked some of the friends that I'd made here to take me to these places where they were claiming there were tigers in the mountains. And lo and behold, found tiger signs wherever they took me. We found tiger signs in the valleys at 1,800 meters, 2,000 meters. We found tiger signs at the tops of the mountains at 3,000 meters. They were everywhere, the signs were. And so were the stories of tigers everywhere. I was really shocked. Um, I didn't understand why tigers would be there. Um, like I said, it was the turn of the decade. Tigers were doing really badly, even in areas that were protected by the government. And here I was finding signs of tigers where they shouldn't really be. Um, the Bang Valley, just to the north of the Bang Valley is Tibet, where most of the tigers end up dead. Uh, the tiger populations has, had plummeted because of the rising trade in, in illegal parts uh, for the traditional Chinese medicine. So it made no sense. And the question I asked out loud is, why are these tigers here? Who's keeping them there? Someone should be protecting these tigers if they're there, because they must be protected. That's what I knew. And that sort of became uh, the question uh, that I, want, I sought out to answer. I started a PhD program. Uh, there were more and more indications that the tigers there were connected to the stories I was hearing from the people. So I decided to do a PhD in anthropology, which is the study of human culture, and basically humanity. Um, and I went back uh, to spend two years uh, in the Bang Valley. I wanted to find out what allowed tigers to exist there in those unique situations. It was a unique habitat. I didn't see any of the normal prey species that tigers depended on. There was no spotted deer. There was no somber deer. People told of species that uh, were goat-like. I had never heard of them. Um, and so it seemed like a, a puzzle that I really wanted to unravel. Uh, the two years that I spent in Dibang Valley, I was told by, by my anthropology supervisors that anthropologists don't do interviews. We learn by living with people. You learn like a child does, by copying people, by learning from them. So I, then I began learning from the Idu. I started to learn the language, um, which was really challenging, if I'm being honest. It was a, it's a Tibetan or Burman language. I don't speak any Tibetan or Burman languages. It's an oral language only, spoken by about 9,000 people. Um, it's never been written down. It's very tonal. I s struggle a lot with tones. Um, and so while I was learning about the Idu culture and the Idu language, I was also learning about the tigers. But let me introduce you to the Bang Valley first. I really think it's a magical place. It begins in the south with tropical, lush mountains. The forest is green, the greenest I've ever seen. Uh, the mountains are fully encased in, mount in cloud forest and tropical rainforest, the northest, northernmost tropical rainforest in the world. As you go up the mountain and so also up the valley towards the Tibetan border, it changes drastically. It starts to open up. There's alpine grasslands. What you see there is pine growing next to bamboo, next to banana, a combination that I thought was fairly rare. Um, you go further up, and the landscape changes entirely. There's strands of pine, old growth, and then there's the mountain forest. The valleys uh, open up. 
you got poplar, birch, oak, maple, Asian varieties, um, get a proper fall like they used to where I used to live in New York. Um, and further up the mountain, closer to the Tibetan Plateau, it snows. It snows a lot in the winter. You go up the mountain, and what you encounter are hundreds of these lakes. These lakes remain frozen for about eight months every year. The waters melt in the summer, and the, and the, and the melting waters trickle down to feed the rivers. These lakes are actually stunningly beautiful, but they're also really important for the Idu Mishmi the inhabitants of the Bang Valley. It is believed that the spirit that owns all of the animals, the animals don't belong to the people or to the forest, they belong to a spirit. He dwells in these lakes. Therefore, when you're in the lakes, you are in his house. You have to follow the rules that he ancestrally created for you. You can't talk loudly. You cannot go to this area with bad thoughts in your heart. You can't quarrel. You can't call animals by their names. You have to call them by pseudonames because animals can hear. And there's lots of other rules. But these are also places where when Idu people die and their souls are, are, are on a journey to the outside world, the souls stop in these lakes. So these lakes have a lot of spirituality. They're not spiritual in the sense of meditation. They're spiritual because of spirit presence. And the lakes are just stunning. They're, you know, they come in all sorts of forms and colors. Um, these high elevations are places of very fickle climate. You arrive, it's nice and sunny like that. You go to bed, you wake up, and you're not able to open your tent. That happened overnight in a few hours. Um, it really is a magical land. And now a little bit about the Idu Mishmi, the people I now call family. Um, the Idu Mishmi are one of the 26 indigenous groups that are recognized by the Constitution of India as inhabiting the state of Arunachal Pradesh, of which the Bang Valley is a part. Uh, there's currently fewer than 13,000 Idus. Um, Idus are what we call traditional animists, which means that um, animists believe uh, that um, just like humans, spirits, and animals, also have capacities of moral decision making. They have moral consciousness. So when you live in a world where all the things have the same morality that you do, they make decisions on the fly about what is good, what is bad, the life radically changes. And such is the life for the Idu people. While Idu is a small community, it's about 13,000 people, uh, they're very diverse socioeconomically. There's Idus that are politicians, have more wealth than I've ever seen in my life. There's Idus that have PhD degrees and are professors in the local universities. But there's also Idus that live about a four-day walk from the nearest road and eke out a living entirely based on what forest and land gives them. So it's a very diverse community, but they're all animists. Christianity is taking foot in the Idu Valley as it is taking foot in most of the indigenous world. And currently about 15 to 20 percent of the Idus are Christians. Um, the Idus have a very funky looking cow. It's a cattle. It's a semi domesticated gaur, which is a wild bison that is common in, South e uh, in Southeast Asia. The Idus have managed to se domesticate it, semi, sort of semi domesticated. They're free ranging, they're not husbanded, they're not milked, uh, they are not used for draught. They are ceremonial animals. If an Idu man wants to marry, he will have to give mithun. To the, to the father of the bride, and then ceremonially uh, purchase the bride in exchange for mithun. Mithun are actually believed to be equivalent to people. Ba back in the day, when Idus would rage war, instead of killing the person, you'd go kill their mithun. Um, they're sacrificed uh, ceremonially in festivals and in weddings and other occasions. Now, um, what I did, now the first thing that I wanted to find out is exactly how many tigers lived there. There were indications of a population based on stories, but I wanted to find facts. After all, I am a scientist. So I, have you, as, you, as you've seen, the mountains are stunning, but they're incredibly dense. They're blanketed by, by this forest that's almost impenetrable. So my eyes in the forest were camera traps. Um, I placed camera traps uh, throughout the two years that I was there. 
um, I would team up with the local landowners, different villages in Idu society on different parcels of forest. Wherever I was, I would team up with the, with the, the village folks there. And then off we would go into the forest. The villages are in the forest, but I wanted to cover a huge area. So we would go on, on trips away from the village that lasted anywhere between 10 to 14 days. Would carry our supplies, would carry camera traps. There are no roads there, so everything had to be carried on the back. There was always a gun. Um, and then off we'd go placing cameras. During the day, we'd place cameras. At night, around fire, I would sit down, open up my book, write notes, and also wrote, learn 20 new Idu words a day. Uh, my uh, PhD supervisor had told me that's how missionaries learn languages of indigenous people. Wrote, learn words, 20 words every day for three months, and you'll see how you pick up the language. He was right. And over two years, I was able to place close to 300 cameras, blanketing the Idu area with lots and lots of camera traps, all the way from the valley bottoms to the tops of the mountains. These little dots are camera traps, uh, well, camera points. Um, the results were great. Now let's see if this works. No. Uh, I found evidence of 12 unique tigers in an area of about 500 square kilometer. They seemed to be quite abundant. We would see pug marks wherever we went. There was this one valley in which you'd see tiger pug marks, you'd go in that direction, and in the evening when you'd come back, on your footprints will be new tiger pug marks. Uh, there were females with cubs. They were reproducing. The tigers seemed to be doing really well. But in addition to tigers, I found tons and tons of other animals. Uh, sorry about that. The clouded leopards, which I think are phenomenally beautiful animals. Then there were other cats, the golden cat. The golden cat gets its name from that color, the golden color. But in the Bang Valley, I was finding images of cats that looked like this, like that, sorry, like that, like that, and also like that. I was really confused. It took me a really long time to actually figure out that they, these cats were all same species. They were all golden cats. In the Bang Valley, they exist in six different color morphs. Color morphs, similar to uh, sort of the black leopard, the panther that you all have in Sri Lanka too, um, is a common occurrence in some cat species. But to have six different colors and all of them living in the same area was the first record in the world. This actually, the, the, the different colors have been recorded from different places. This is the first record, uh, first color pattern uh, ever recorded for this species. We call it tightly rosetted. It's not a really cool name. That's all I could come up with for my nerdy mind. Um, what was really cool about the cats were that they were, they were interbreeding, but when they would come out, and they would come out different colors, we were finding them in different elevations. So they were segregating themselves into different habitats, we suspect based on what would maximize their fitness, what would allow them to be better hunters. So what we're, we were seeing right now was an evolutionary phenomena in the making. Then we also found um, the Asiatic wild dog, also called Dhol. Packs of up to 12 to 15 individuals are common in Indian plains. But here, up in the mountains, the packs were no more than three individuals. And then this animal. Um, I don't usually do quiz when I give talks, but does anyone know what this is? No, but close. Anyone else? All right, you know what, nobody gets the price then. Um, this is a Mishmitakin. Uh, Mishmitakin is a goat antelope uh, that is endemic to eastern part of the state, um, all the way into China, through northern Burma and also Bhutan. Uh, the Mishmitakin gets its name from the Idu Mishmi, because when they were first discovered, uh, they were discovered in the Idu Mishmi area. They're incredible animals. I mean, and the males get to the size of a cow. And they're the nomads of the, of the eastern Himalayas. They undertake huge migrations altitudinally. Uh, in the summer, uh, they go all the way up to the, to the meadows when the snow has melted and the new grasses come out. 
And when it starts to, to get cold and the snow starts to fall, they descend down into the valleys when Idu hunters also hunt them. I think they're fantastic beasts. Um, and a lot of them were actually quite curious about my camera traps. I don't think they knew what they were looking at and why the thing was blinking. Um, we've seen herds that were up to 80 individuals strong. Um, they're fairly widespread and fairly abundant in the Bang Valley. Those are youngsters just, just uh, putting out horns. The older females and males have their horns curved. But these are the animals that local people would tell me tigers follow up and down the mountains. They are their biggest prey. Um, we also found uh, two species of macaques, the aeronatural macaque and the Assamese macaque. The aeronatural macaque is a really specialized animal that's found only in the northern parts of the state. Uh, sorry. And then uh, the red panda. Um, as the images were coming in, I was realizing what this place was. The tigers there shared the same mountains as red pandas, and none of the other species that we knew that depended on in other parts of the country. Um, sorry, there's, I think I'm not pressing it right. Um, there was also a huge amount of bird diversity in the area. In the Mishmi Hills, the, the, the eastern part of the state, uh, there have been records of close to 600 species of birds. Um, and also a very high level of en endemism in, tr in, in terms of birds. Uh, these are not endemic birds, but they're, uh, they're beautiful and interesting nonetheless. This is, on the left, is the Temex tragopan, and down here is the Himalayan mona. Um, what I was finding in terms of tigers, the animals that I went there to look for, was that, um, sorry, I should back up and tell you that the northern part of the Bang Valley um, so the Bang Valley overall is about um, a fourth of the size of Sri Lanka, or 15 times the size of Yala National Park. It is very, very big. Um, the northern part of the Bang Valley, about a quarter of, of the area, has been declared a wildlife sanctuary. Um, that area itself is about four and a half times larger than Yala National Park, but has four park guards. So by all means, it is a paper park. There is no enforcement on the ground. Yet, I wanted to look at whether things were different uh, in, in that wildlife sanctuary. What I found, actually, was that the forest that was held by the Idu community had five times as many tigers as the wildlife sanctuary. And I'll come to this later on in my talk, why that is important. Overall, um, I estimated that up to 50 individual tigers could live in the Bang Valley which would make the tiger population in the Bang Valley greater than 70% of the tiger reserves that are managed by governments, uh, the Indian government in people-free areas that they own and they run. So this was a sizable population of tigers. In terms of what the tigers were feeding on, the tigers were feeding on two species of barking deer. There's a common munjak, which is found all over Asia. And there is a specific variety of munjak called gongshang munjak, which is only found in that area. So two species of munjak, wild pig, the Mishmi Takin that we saw, and Himalayan serao. Pictures of that I don't have here. I also used my camera traps to find out how abundant these animals were. And what I found very quickly, not to complicate things, in color here are the population or the abundance of the population sizes of these animals in the Bang Valley, and in black are all the other populations in protected tiger reserves across the tiger range. And they were exactly the same. There were just as many animals in the Bang Valley as there were in protected tiger reserves. The same goes for the deer. So what I was finding was now the tigers were just as abundant, the prey was doing really well, but by now I knew the Idus were, were hunting. I went hunting with them. I was eating the wildlife that I was being offered, even though I didn't want to. Uh, but sometimes we'd get caught up in snowstorms, food supplies would run out, we'd have to hunt to eat. Um, so while they were hunting, yet the populations were just as good as they were in areas where there was no hunting going on. This is a dirty word in conservation, sustainable hunting. But I thought this is what was going on. And if that is exactly what was going on, Idus were hunting sustainably, I wanted to find out how had the sustainability been reached in that area. 
So that's when I started asking around. I mean, I'd been there for already a year. I was starting to speak, uh, I was starting to understand a lot of Idu, speak a little bit of Idu. And what was common to me uh, there about the Idu culture is one phenomena that permeated all aspects of Idu life. And loosely, these were restrictions. There was lots and lots of restrictions on, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, no matter whatever aspect of life there was. The Idu people call this collective phenomena of restrictions, the Iduena. Now, what is the Iduena? Um, whenever there is a social event of significance, such as funerals, childbirth, marriages, um, war, not now, back in the day, farming, any activity where the shaman is present, any festivals when you go on a hunt, anything uh, that you do comes with these restrictions. And that is what the Idu call the Ena. There is a very unique connection between these activities and the forest. The common thing is that in all of these activities, the restriction is on eating wild meat. And when you go hunting and you've got an animal and you eat that wild meat, you can't do any of these social activities. So, so the whole culture is about drawing the separation between what is social and what is natural. Yet, by putting them together in contradiction to each other, you integrate them more than you would think. And so every aspect of Idu, Idu existence, from the birth of an Idu person to the death, from, and everything in between, from marriage to farming to livelihoods, all of them reminded them of what they cannot do in the forest and the restrictions, the Anna. Everybody told me that we've got animals here, and all of these animals that you're finding, and not in the valley next door, and not in Namdafa Tiger Reserve, in, within, in the state of Arunachal Pradesh, because of Idu Anna. Being a scientist, I wanted to find out whether they were true. So I conducted a, a massive survey in which um, I, I think I'm jumping ahead. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna talk about what's on the slide. Uh, but coming back to, coming back to the, the ENA and how it, how it sort of permeates every aspect of Idu life. The ENA applies differently to different people. And also when you're out hunting, it applies differently to different animals. Not all animals are made equal. To these animals, which is the cats, the big cats, the tigers, the clouded leopard, and the hula gibbon, the eastern hula gibbon, which is also an endemic species to this part of the country, um, the ana applies very strictly. You cannot kill these animals. Why? Because these animals are people. They're human kin. They were born with the Idu people. So the ana is very strict. You don't kill who you are. You don't kill your own blood. You don't kill your brothers. And this is why I think the connection with the tiger is so strong and sort of the crux of my research is this kinship, this bond of brotherhood. Every Idu person, ever since they're little, they're little knows the story without failure, the story of the Idu and tiger brotherhood. And the story goes like this. The ancestral couple, before any Idus, any people were created, the ancestral couple gave birth to their first child. The child came out of the mom's womb, but it had stripes, and it didn't look anything like the mother. The mother was horrified. The child suddenly leapt out of the window of the house and went off into the forest. The parents were really worried what had happened, what she had just given birth to. They conceived again and had another child. The second child was a man, the first Idu man, from whom all Idus descend. They had a third child, and the third child was the Hula Gibbon. Also looked a little bit like the, per the man, but not quite, and went off into the forest. Now, when the Idu man grew old, he went into the jungle for his first ever hunt. He had grown up with his mom telling him that you actually have a brother. We don't talk to him anymore. He lives out in the forest. If you see him, say hello. He went off in the forest, and he ran into his brother, Tiger. The tiger had also heard that he had had a human brother. They instantly got to know each other, and they went off hunting together. They got a deer. And when the deer was on the, on the forest floor, um, the Idu brothers tried to light fire. The tiger said, why are you lighting the fire? We eat our meat just like that. Look at my teeth. This is my machete. And my stomach has the fire, and the blood will extinguish the blood, the, the, that fire. We don't need any of this. The brother was horrified. He ran back to his house, told his parents that the tiger was actually really voracious 
and he could kill us. He then plotted to kill the tiger. The tiger died. The creator was so aggrieved at the act of a brother killing another brother that he unleashed all of the diseases that haunt the Idus till the day. The, disease, the diseases like leprosy and epilepsy that attack your form, who you are. The creator rebirthed the tiger and ordered it to go live high up on the top of the, of the mountains. That's where the tiger still lives to the day. The brother, on the other hand, started to establish villages in the valleys. But the tiger do, does descend into the valleys, and that's where tense confrontations between the two still happen. But this is the story of the tiger brotherhood that every Idu will tell you, and that is why you don't kill tigers. The knowledge of the value of tiger parts in the legal market is very widespread in the, in the Idu area. Everybody knows, they get approached by Nepali traders, by Muslim traders from different parts of the country, because now the news of tigers, the news of tigers locally was always, was always around. But Idus don't kill tigers, because killing a tiger will invoke this ancestral curse that stays for generations. The revenge of the tiger is still a reality for most of the Idus. Now, coming back to, to the Yena, it applies differently to the big cats and the gibbon. You don't kill any of those. It applies differently to all of these animals, the large tiger prey. You can hunt them, Idus hunt them, but you hunt them under certain restrictions. After a hunter has bagged one of these things and he brings it back to the village, he cannot do the following things for five days. He cannot have sexual relations, he cannot sleep in the same house as the rest of the women in the family, he cannot cook in the same utensils or eat in any of the same plates uh, utensils as the rest of the family, he cannot go to a place where there's a shaman present, he cannot eat garlic, onion, and a number of herbs, and cannot wash clothes for an entire lunar month. Idu women do not eat meat of any large animals at all, since the moment they become women from girls. And they, they can resume eating the meat after they've become older ladies, so after they've stopped their, their reproductively active cycle. And so these are the, the, the second tier of anna. You can, you can hunt them, but under all these restrictions. And then there's a third tier. Whenever a shaman comes to your house, he'll announce a taboo that is temporal, that lasts anywhere between 10 months to a few hours, depending upon how serious the issue is that the shaman has come to solve. So there's these different gradients of taboos. Um, like I said, it permeates all aspects of Idu life. And this is what I wanted to know. When people were telling me that the, the Anna was actually responsible for the wildlife there, I wanted to interrogate that. So I designed a survey. I went to 100 houses every month for nine months, and I asked them if they had followed any taboos, any enna, and why they had done that, and whether they had eaten any wild meat. What I found was that during taboo periods, the meat consumption dropped by almost 90%. So that the things that people were telling me actually bore out scientifically. These animals were there because people were not hunting them because of the taboos. Now, the Idus don't like the taboos. They're always complaining. They always want to be like me, like us. They're like, oh, you guys from the north of the country and other parts of the country, you're free to do whatever. You can sleep with your women after you have meat. Um, and they, and, they, and their, their, their neighbors did the same. Uh, so they don't like the taboos, but you can't do anything. You have to follow them because that's what the world is. That's what the rules have been ever since the first Idus walked the planet. Now. Um, the women in all of this actually played a really curious and a very important role. As a man not from the area, as a foreign man, I had restricted access into female and feminine spaces. I lived with the local family. I had my host sister-in-law and my host mother. Um, through them, I learned a lot more about the, the lives of Idu women. A lot of, um, so like I said, the Idu women don't eat wildlife, uh, large bleeding animals. They do eat rodents and fish and birds. And their husbands and their brothers uh, and their fathers take great pains to go out into the, into the forest and provide a constant supply of these smaller animals for them. The reason why Idu women do not eat, the reason that I was told they do not eat wild meat is because the spirit gets mad if you do that and you get all these diseases. You can't have childbirth. Idu women are seen as weaker, just like children are seen as weaker. They need to be protected from the spirits that are really powerful. Therefore, 
if you stop eating them, giving them meat, they will be protected. But while this culture sees Idu women as weak, there's actually another reason how this dynamic is changing. Now Idus are modernizing. Back in the day, Idus would live in long houses with many, many, many rooms in sort of a railroad design. Each of those rooms would belong to a different wife. Idus are polygamous people. And each room had its own hearth where you can, make, you can cook. Now, with modern houses coming in, there's only one kitchen and one hearth. Like I said, the taboo spreads, uh, or the taboo is also on sharing meat uh, utensils. It is, there's a taboo on sharing utensils because it spreads. If I'm tabooed and I eat in the same place as you, you will be tabooed too. You will also have to do everything that I have to do, all the restrictions. A lot of modern Nidu women have jobs or they have to go to the, into the field. If you have young kids and you can't wash clothes for a month, uh-uh. And so a lot of Nidu women don't allow their husbands to eat meat. And a lot of husbands are always complaining. Um, and so while the culture was, uh, wants to protect the women, you know, so it's ingrained, there's also this dynamic that is changing with, with the lifestyle change. But there was another reason that actually dawned upon me why this, this exists after I had read the literature and the writings of other researchers who had studied other indigenous communities in the Amazon in Southeast Asia. The reason why this separation exists between genders and wild meat, and it's fairly common actually throughout a lot of forest dwelling cultures, it's because of blood. Um, the blood of the forest runs in its animals. The blood of the people that engenders life runs in the people, especially in the women. Women give birth to, to life, they create life. And it's the blood of the forest that is dangerous to the blood of humanity. And women, as the carriers of humanity, as the carriers of the, of the life, have to be protected from that blood. The blood of both of the forest and the people looks the same. And so the mixing of that blood can endanger the blood of the people. And this is sort of in the back the reasons why a lot of indigenous cultures do not have women, especially during reproductively active periods, eating wild meat. And the other character, sorry, I've already said that. I would ask, and you know, a lot of people will tell me that um, you know, they, they won't allow their husbands to, to eat meat and come back to the house. So sometimes the husband has to, had to sleep out on the porch. And the other character that was really important in this whole dynamics maintaining this was the shaman. Nothing in Idu life is a coincidence. Everything happens for a reason. Everything happens because you did something. Everything is a response to something that you did. So if you have neck pain or your mithun are not having calves or your hens are dying or your children are not doing well at school, you'll go to the shaman. The shaman will look into your life and into your past. And almost always, the shaman will draw a connection between what's happening now and what you didn't do or you did wrongly. You didn't follow this taboo. Someone in your family, many generations ago, killed a tiger. And it's a revenge of the tiger in your family. That's why your grandfather died, or your nephew got lost in the forest, or the water and the rivers swallowed up your knees. The shamans keep reminding that it's the law of the nature, the culture, that you have to follow in order to prosper. And all of these laws are connected to not hunting, to keeping the nature in its form. Well, yes, hunting, but hunting in a regulated way. Now, to come back to my, my question, the question that I wanted to answer, why were there tigers there? And I think a lot of factors came together in this land uh, to have the tigers in that area. Now, we know that uh, tigers need three things to survive. They need protection from direct persecution. They need an abundant supply of large prey. And they also need lots of habitat. And there are different aspects of Idu culture that ensured that these things ex existed. Idu livelihoods, Idu land is kept in its natural state. Um, then the taboos, the Iduena on tiger prey, and maintained very high densities of wild prey there. And then the Tiger Brotherhood had kept tigers protected from direct persecution. And all of this is protected by the, a mandate in the Indian constitution that applies to all the indigenous areas of Northeast India that grant autonomy to local people. If you're not an indigenous person of the area, you can't seek entry into that without a permit. To seek residence into that area, you need a permit and a sponsorship from a local person. 
that has kept the Idu population, that kept the local population low, primarily low Idu, and the, the land is owned by the Idu people and it's run according to customary laws. So this is, I think, is a potent example of what um, sort of different belief systems and indigenous belief systems can do when they're given patronage and protection by the state. Now, um, I wanted to draw a couple of uh, threads from the, from the story. Hmm. Something that um, I think are quite universally applicable. I don't think there are, I mean, Idus only live in the Bang Valley, so this case may seem quite unique. But I think the lessons that reveal themselves to me as I grew in that area, both as an academic and also um, as someone who understood this, this system and understood how this relationship, this forest and its, its culture worked. Um, and I, I think these lessons are fairly universally applicable. Um, a lot of people ask me or whether, you know, the, I tell the story and immediately the story is termed, oh, the story of peaceful coexistence. On the opposite end of the spectrum is what is commonly discussed in conservation circles is the story of perpetual conflict, that man and animal is always in conflict. I think the Idu story, like many other stories in the world, is neither. It's neither a story of perpetual conflict nor a story of peaceful coexistence. Idus hate tigers. They're, they're afraid of them. They would wish tigers away if they could, but they can't because the tiger is the brother that has to live in the forest with them. So it's not, it's not a peaceful coexistence at all. It's just that they can't kill them. The tigers come into the villages and they kill Mithun, the Mithun that is also a person. And when that happens, there's tense confrontations. You don't know what is happening. The, the story says that the brother has come down to the village to, to, to seek revenge for you because your ancestors killed it. So every time there is cattle depredation, the story is re reenacted. And it's because of this story that the story frustrates the Idu, but it also presents, uh, prevents retaliation, which is a leading cause of tiger deaths and predator deaths uh, across the range. So it is a complicated relationship. It's neither peaceful coexistence, not a story of conflict. Typically, they lead separate lives. The tigers are out in the forest, the Idus are in their villages, but there's times when, these, when episodes of conflict happen. The next thing that I think is a message that is fairly universally applicable. While, while I'm promoting this message of we need to understand local cultures, local ways of living, local ways of understanding relations with wildlife, I think we also need to, to make sure that we don't fall into the ten tendency of romanticizing certain cultures that may have a con conservation impact. And the, evidence, and, and the proof of that is also in the story of the, of the Idu people and wildlife. While the Idu people have been able to conserve a very threatened population of these tigers, um, there's another animal, the musk deer, which is also very valuable in international market, markets that has almost entirely disappeared from the Idu area. Male musk deers have glands in their body, the musk pots, that are very valuable for the traditional Asian medicine. You also get the scent, the musk scent from the, from the glands, and they have huge amounts of, uh, of demand in Middle, e Middle East and other parts. Um, am I running over? Ah, oh, okay. Um, and so the must deer has been hunted for generations of Vidus. The, the hunts, the must deer lives on the tops of the mountains, so the hunts are dangerous. It may snow any times, so the ridges are narrow. Also remember the tops of the mountains is where spirits live, and the spirits are vicious. Um, but they've been important. Back in the day, Idus would sell mustard in return for salt, for in return for metal to make machetes, in return for beads, in return for cloth. The newer generations of Idus, rural Idus in particular, have been selling mustard to send their kids to school, to buy TVs, to buy motorbikes. So it's a very important component of the local economy. That there is no taboo on hunting mustard. In fact, it's integrated into what makes you a successful hunter. Back in the day, you would sell musk deer and get the money that you got from it, you would buy mithun. Um, the more mithun you had, the richer you were. The more mithun you sacrificed, 
even spiritually more powerful you were. Idus believe that every time you, you sacrifice a mithun and you send the animal spirit off, the animal spirit goes and paves the way on the pathway to the, to the land of the dead. And when the person dies, the soul of the person follows the pathway that the mithun have created. So it's very, uh, so the, the purchase of mithun is what made people spiritually powerful. So the, the must here are very important. And when you combine the rising cost of must pods currently with the, with the increased trade in wildlife and low amounts of restrict, cultural restrictions, what you get is a collapse in the population of must -year. So it's really important, I think, it's in this story to understand what different animals mean for the Idu people. The tigers, for what they mean, no matter how uh, much, how valued they are in the international markets, and they're very valued. We believe that a tiger, when all of its parts are sold, is worth anywhere between 500,000, um, sorry, 50,000 to 100,000 US dollars. So they're very valuable, but they're not hunted and they've been protected. So it's important to understand these nuances in the culture when you want to integrate that into, into nature conservation. And finally, about the future, it's a question that you know, kind of keeps me up at night. I'm, I'm very emotional about, about this area. It's no longer just a PhD topic that made me a doctor. Um, it is where I now live. Uh, it is uh, where I have now family and, uh, and where I want to work. Um, the future, future I th I'm, I'm not too certain about. Um, and that's sort of the, well, if the heroes of the story are the Idus and the tigers, the villains of the story are, are now. Um, the um, plans for the area is to dam the main river in the Bang Valley, the Bang River, um, into a series of 17 dams. Two of these will be the largest dams in a country that already has more than 3,500 dams. Um, shortly after, these plans are being put in place now. They're not, not all of the dams have been sanctioned. They're in different places of approvals by the federal government. When I finished my field uh, research in 2015, in 2016, the news was getting out. Uh, the government of India sent a team to look for tigers in the area. Uh, the team went directly for the wildlife sanctuary in the north, whose boundaries are anybody's guess, because every, there's forest everywhere. Um, and like I said, it's a, it's a huge area with only five guards that rarely leave their house. So there's, there's nowhere you can tell this is the boundary and this is not. They went into the wildlife sanctuary and placed camera traps, and they found tigers. Um, they then declared that the tigers in that area preferred higher elevations. The tigers do go to higher elevations, but what my research found was that females were producing babies, or cubs, in lower elevation valleys, which would then go up into higher elevations fo following the prey, but then would come back down into lower elevations in the winter. They were using the whole landscape. The team from the government, though, placed cameras only in the higher elevation, found tigers, didn't, was, wasn't curious about all of the rest of the forest that they saw uh, on their 12-hour journey to the to where the, where the sanctuary begins. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You, you place cameras where you want to find tigers, you find tigers, and then you say that that's where tigers like to live. So the, the narrative that's being weaved now is that the tigers like the higher elevation areas, so therefore the lower elevation valleys can be made into dams. Um, I think this is a dangerous precedence. Um, this has happened in too many places, and a lot of these relationships between people and wildlife, are, like I said, are not unique to the Bang Valley. There's some unique parts to it, but the relationships that span this, this spectrum um, are not unique. And a lot of these areas are combined forces of conservation um, directed primarily by scientists who are biologists. No offense to biologists, but um, I believe conservation is a social project. You can't talk to animals and tell them not to get killed by our bullets or fall into our traps. You have to talk to people. But most conservationists are trained as biologists. Like I thought I would become a conservationist by doing a degree in, in, in environmental sciences. Um, so a lot of these plans drawn up by biologists and also plans that are drawn up by developers, these combined forces divide up land that where nature and culture sort of interplay into this discrete uh, sort of bits that we understand. We like order. 
we like to have a place for wildlife and we like to have a place for, for development. And I think this, this, in this area, this is not what should be the case. The system is already working. Why, are, why do we want to mess it up? We'll go there, we'll, we mess it up. And once it's destabilized, then we blame it on local people. We shouldn't have been there for, I mean, the system was working fine. And I mean, it's actually working fine till now, but it's the future that, that sort of worries me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I tend to get carried away towards the end of the presentation because it becomes really personal. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, that's, the, uh, that's the story that I wanted to share with you today. Um, thank you again for having me, and I'll be happy to take any questions now. Indeed, uh, very different angles to the regular conversations we have. Uh, before we start the q and I want to ask you something. <laughs> can you uh, speak uh, a few words in the Hindu language so that we can get a flavor of the dialect, if you don't mind? Sure. Um, well, I'll say, um, uh, hello, how are you? Pray um, ba. Um, I actually asked two questions. <laughs> How are you? And where did you come from today? <laughs> Thanks. So uh, I'm sure there will be questions galore. I think there are a couple of mics out here. So my colleagues uh, so will open up the floor for questions. Uh, as always, please focus on the question rather than a long discourse around what you've been doing or what you think. Right, so please keep your question time short and precise. Thank you. Talk, uh, truly amazing. Um, can you just speak about like the challenges? You touched on it at the end, but can you talk about like some of what you're looking at? Um, how to combat like some of the damn projects that are coming in the future and some of the other challenges that you're facing uh, and the people as well? Um. Thank you. I thought that question would come up. It all kind of, I should have answered that during, during the talk. It's a very obvious question. Um, we, um, the, the story is never one. It's never, there's always multiple sides to, to a coin, if you may. Um, there's actually a lot of Idu people that support the dams, and they want the dams there. And a, lot, and a huge part of the reason why Idu people support the dams is because so far, um, there was only one road throughout the valley. There's one road in the whole of the valley, which is, like I said, a quarter of the size of Sri Lanka, um, which was only motorable in the dry season. And it rains eight months out of the year. Um, they were asking for the road to be made better, but it wasn't given. Um, there's one hospital in the higher valley, which is very poorly stocked. They've been asking for a better hospital. No. There's two high schools in the entire valley. Um, lots of children, if they want to study, they have to go to boarding schools. They've been asking for more of those. None of these things have been given to the Idu people. The moment dams came on the, on, on the plate, they were told, everything that you've always wanted, jobs, better hospitals, roads, will, be, will come with the dams. So clearly, if you want your children to survive, or your, your, yourself to survive, to be able to make it to the hospital, to have a motorable road, which they should have, because we in Delhi and Bombay should have roads too, um, that'll only come with the dams. Uh, so the dams have become the dream for modernity that everybody, every, anywhere in the world craves. Um, so there's actually um, a fair amount of support in the Idu people. While they're very anxious about what, a lot of people don't know what a dam is. Um, about, I would say about 98% of the people do not know, or Idu people do not know what a dam means. When they say it's 3,400 megawatts, what is a megawatt? Or those zeros, what do that mean? There's no conception of that uh, yet. Uh, the dream is, is of the dams. What I, I, I don't want to speak for the Idu people. I'm not Idu myself. So if the Idus want dams, they should have the right to decide their destiny. Uh, but there's also a lot of Idus that actually don't want dams. And in, in collaboration with some of them, uh, we've tried to, I've tried to give my science to the committees. One of the dam was put on pause. Uh, uh, that started a whole controversy. Um, a lot of the people who wanted the dams don't like me no more. Um, 
And, but so that's, so basically I think one of the, re, one of the things that we've been trying to do in areas where uh, these projects are pushed through the system, the system that has a lot of checks and balances, they're pushed through because uh, the only science that exists uh, is done by damn companies. And that is shoddy science, um, lies mostly, copies copied from other existing reports. So presenting our facts, presenting a counter argument is what I've been trying to do. There's some local people that have brought litigation against the damn companies. Um, I'm not involved in that. Uh, the other end on the tigers, because the connection is so close with the culture, and I think regardless of the tiger, it's a fascinating culture. And we're all better off with the diversity that we have uh, because of the Igbo people in many such communities. Um, we're starting a number of new initiatives. I've actually um, been able to secure funding to open up a shaman school. Uh, like I said, there's fewer than 40 shamans left. Um, new people are not taking up shamanism um, because it's not seen as a viable livelihood and the prestige attached to it has also waned with time. So we want to encourage a new generation of shamans. So we have funding to support three students in the beginning to see them through to their journey to, to becoming shamans. Um, we also are in the process of securing funding to do more research uh, in areas where new dams are being proposed to so do more camera trapping. I wasn't able to cover a huge part of the valley. It's, it's vast. Uh, so I want to do that. We also want to develop a curriculum in the local language, which is also disappearing because all the children are sent off to boarding schools. And when they come back, they don't speak the language. They don't understand these cultural categories. So a curriculum, so taking the language to them as opposed to expecting them to learn um, language that, according to many, is redundant in, in today's time. Good question. Yes. Um, so the, the the question is that one of the persons in the photograph is wearing something on the shoulder which was made of teeth, and yes, it was. It was primarily made of uh, bear canines, but it also had four tiger canines. Um, like I said, uh, shamans are believed to be tigers themselves. And they become tiger by wearing the tiger on their bodies. And it is this, it's called Amrallah. And the Amrallah is what gives them the power. Um, back in the day, when uh, tigers would accidentally get caught in the traps laid, laid for other animals, um, and upon discovery, a shaman would come and then pacify the spirit of the tiger um, and then extract the teeth. Uh, these necklaces that are made of the tiger teeth are passed on from one shaman to another. So a lot of them are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Um, and it's what makes the shamans powerful and makes them into tigers. Did you, did you face any struggle in becoming a part of the family of the tribal oh, people? Do you face any struggles in becoming a part of the family of the indigenous people because you are obviously a foreigner to them? Did you face any resistance from them? Or how long did it take you to actually feel home with them? Well, I, um, I, um, my whole research from the very beginning was conceived with members of the community. So when I initially arrived there, I met, um, am I still loud? No? Yeah? OK. Um, I met uh, a local man there called G.B. Pulu. Um, he, had, he was an Idu man who had been educated in New Delhi, worked there for a number of months, um, obviously was very frustrated with the city that is Delhi. It's very frustrating. Um, and decided to move back. He went back to the Bang Valley and then now runs uh, small-scale small ecotourism. Um, I met him the first time I arrived there in 2011. We hit it off, and I, when I was finding more about the tigers, uh, and I wanted to do a study, I asked him if he would be a partner of mine in that study. We grew very close. I now call him Nabajibi, which he's my godfather. Um, and his children uh, are now my sort of god uh, brothers and sisters. Um, and uh, we did everything together. He would take me to the villages where I wanted to go, introduce me there, and then leave me there. And then it was up to me uh, to make connections. But um, so there was, 
I, because of him, because of the study was designed, a lot of the places that I selected to go to, we did it together. Uh, some of the questions that I wanted to answer were, were together. He's on all of my academic publications as a co-author. Um, uh, but there was, the challenge was not so much integrating myself with the people. The people are kind and open-hearted. The challenge was erasing the conceptions that people have of, of conservationists. Um, anyone that is related to wildlife belongs to the forest department. And the only thing that the forest department does in a lot of these areas is declare national parks uh, without asking people. Um, they wake up to find out that their, their ancestral land is now the property of the government. Um, so when they saw me, um, they thought I was sent by the forest department to survey their lands so more of their land could be declared protected. So it was this suspicion that took a very long time uh, to undo or to remove. Um, and I, I remember I was already a year, and you know, the fact that I was putting camera traps out in the forest, a technology that people hadn't heard of, didn't help my case. It was very suspicious, the whole activity. You know, these pictures coming out, these cameras. Um, a lot of people would, you know, there was actual community members that later on I found out were spying on me too, to find out who I really was and where I came from. Um, it was not until a year into my stay there, about nine months into my stay there, that I um, participated in a festival. And I was really keen on understanding that festival because it's a five-day festival, which is, and causes a lot of sacrifice. The shaman leads it, and the shaman doesn't sleep for five days, chants regularly, constantly, the whole time. So I didn't sleep for five days either. I don't recommend it. Um, it was um, during that time that you know I was um, sort of giving out meat, there was pigs that were being sacrificed and mithun and everything. I think people at that time saw me differently and since that time they saw me as a person who was not there just to study tigers but also to study their culture and to understand. Also I think the fact that I started to speak the, the language after um, about a, like nine months into my stay there helped a lot because it showed that I was, I, I'm not still fluent, I don't think I ever will be. Uh, but I think it showed that I really was serious about this. suspense there. Um, so I have a question. So I read the article about this work back in April in Sanctuary Asia, and I was fascinated for sure. I think it's an amazing story. I think the work you've done is incredible, and your dedication is what every conservationist needs to be able to survive these systems, right? Um, and at the end of the article, you talk a little about the idea of the cultural reserve and the conflicts that happened you know, with uh, the departments and stuff like that. Would you be able to just talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's a interesting concept, the whole cultural reserve, and who should look after these areas, and should they be designated in the formal designation and stuff? Thank you very much. Um, um, I've written a series of articles. Um, I mean, don't, if you're keen, there's, there's quite a lot of material to read. And these are popular articles. They're not full of scientific jargon. Um, the, um, I, I think that, I mean, my personal belief, again, I'm nobody but this is what I personally believe. Um, this is a system that's already working. The tigers are there, they've got enough to eat, um, it's working. Um, I don't think we need to mess with it. And so a cultural, it already is a cultural reserve. It's a reserve by the virtue, it's a cultural reserve by the virtue, virtue of our constitution that doesn't allow people who are not from this culture permanent residency in, in, in the area. And the culture is so integrate, uh, so, so inti in Intricately, is that the word? Yeah, uh, yeah. Link to link to tigers. That just an, as an extension of that, the tigers are there. So I don't think we need to do anything. But you know, the world is changing. Things are changing, and and nobody has the right to tell other people you can't modernize or become rich or aspire to what I have. Um, and so I think things are going to change. So we will have to develop some sort of a formal mechanism. Uh, I think this formal mechanism should come from the community. It should re reward people. Uh, for, for, for saving uh, tigers 
and uh, such a large source of carbon and oxygen for all of humanity. I think if there is a way to keep it going um, and to increase the, the economic well-being of the people there, it should be through an idea which is called in, um, conservation easements, that people are paid to keep uh, the habitat and, and everything in, 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 um, in, its, in its current form. And, um, I don't think we should, I, I really think we need to label it differently. We, if we keep calling it a tiger reserve, we're going to keep falling into the pit traps of, of, of wanting to, it to be like other tiger reserves. So it, if it's a, cult, you know, the land is a cultural land. Everything has a name. Um, everything has a meaning. Um, and so I, I really do think that we need to back off. Uh, we need to have mechanisms to support the local people. Uh, so that there is there is socioeconomic development that they have access to it. There should be roads. There should be better hospitals. Um, um, in terms of the forest department's involvement, I, I I mean the the this is I think a constant story throughout the global south. And uh, you know a lot of the forest departments that we currently have. And again, I have nothing against any of the departments. I I think some of the operations are a little bit problematic because a lot of these are are carry forwards of a colonial system that was put in place to extract natural resources. Um, and very little has changed, even though we're no longer colonial subjects. Um, and similarly, a lot of there's, the thinking is very different. The thinking is of this, if there is a tree or if there's a, what looks like a forest, it is the property of the state, um, even though the constitution in that area says otherwise. Um, I think a lot of these places where tigers have disappeared, uh, there's obviously an element of conflict with the animal. There's a negative interaction. They come into houses. They kill your cows. It's an actual element. There, you lose. You, uh, but you, what tiger has come to mean in a lot of areas, also reserves where they were poached out of, is it's a symbol of the state. It's a symbol of the forest department that does not care for you that says that you can't go into the forest because that is not for the tiger. So you can't cook uh, because you can't, the firewood not belongs to the tiger. The antagonism is actually towards the forest department, but it's taken out on the tiger. And my fear for this area is that this relationship, no matter how faulty it is, no matter how much it bounces between conflict and coexistence, right now is a relationship that works. The moment uh, you'll, you'll, you'll draw a boundary on the, on the ground and say, this is the tiger's and this is yours. And by the way, a third of your land is now just for the tiger. I don't think the tiger will, will then just be the brother or just be the spirit or just be the shaman. It will become the face of the state that does not listen to you and takes away from you what you think should, have, should be a right. Excuse me. I have two questions. One is, um, is the tiger the Indian tiger or the Southeast Asian tiger um, in that area? And in the higher elevations, does the snow leopard also live? Um, the, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the tiger, um, the, there's very little genetic work that's been done from few individuals because they're quite difficult to come by, the samples. Um, and they are a genetically distinct population. We don't know whether there are uh, the Indo-Chinese tiger or that subspecies or a different one, uh, but they are genetically dis a distinct population from the other populations in the country. We know that much. There is um, a lot, the tiger X folks in the country um, who have seen the pictures that have come out of uh, my camera traps and the camera traps that have since been placed have noticed that these tigers are missing white tips on the backs of their ears. Um, I haven't seen enough ear photographs to really see that pattern. But that's what they believe. And they believe that is because it's a genetically distinct population. Um, as for the snow leopards, no. I led an expedition exclusively to, to place cameras for the snow leopard. They don't exist. And I think they don't exist in that area because it's too wet. Um, it is high elevation. Um, but it rains, like I said, about eight months out of the year. Um, and all of the prey species uh, leave and migrate down into the, into the bottom of the valleys. Um, and they don't have their typical uh, sort of goat species, the, what snow leopards prey on, the baral, the blue sheep, and, and the ibex. Uh, there's the species of goral, uh, red goral. It's really cute, actually. Uh, it's super tiny, but it also migrates down in the elevation. The only animal that stays throughout the year in the high elevation is actually the must deer. 
and I don't think a low density prey could have sustained snow leopard population. Any leopards, pantheropodus? Say what? Any, any regular leopards, pantheropodus? Oh yeah, actually, that's a really curious uh, question too. No, I've not seen any uh, common leopards, which is why there were no photographs. Uh, so there's a tiger uh, in terms of predators, uh, there's clouded leopards, there's wild dogs, uh, and a host of different uh, smaller cats, but no leopards. And I think the reason is because they've been competitively excluded because of the, the prey uh, base that is in that area. Since there's no somber, there's no spotted deer, um, a large prey is taken by tigers, and medium-sized prey is taken by the lower, the, the smaller cats. <coughs> We'll Most take one or two more questions. Tiger attacks among the community. Sorry, can you can you start over? Were there any tiger attacks on people? And if so, how many? I mean, what frequency? And what was the reaction of the people to that? Um, so tiger uh, attacks on people are very rare in that area. Um, the, there's two sort of instance that people talk about, sort of half laughing, half like scared. Um, and one of them is when a tiger fairly recently came into a camp um, and then started playing with a person who was sleeping in a sleeping bag. Um, uh, but the person wasn't killed. Uh, that is a more recent story, but they talk of a tiger killing um, someone about 30 years ago. Um, there's confrontations, people come across tigers in the forest when they're out, and because there are no roads, all trips into the tiger territory, which they're everywhere, um, are on foot, um, which is why people carry the gun. Um, I, um, I don't think they're, I don't, I don't know a lot of people, this, the stories of tigers attacking people were very rare. The stories of tigers attacking livestock are everywhere. I mean, every, everyone has lost a mytham to a tiger. And sometimes there's stories of tigers coming into the villages, jumping into the, the, the pens of pigs, which are right next to the house, and taking the pigs out. Uh, those stories are there, but not really of tigers attacking people. They do attack people, but, sort of, but spiritually. Um, and was there another question to that? Question. No. Very much for your talk. Thank you. The uh, the valley has a very long common boundary with China. Uh, do you think the the lack of poaching of the tiger for body parts to China is because the locals are protecting the tiger? Yes, I believe that very strongly. That's one of the main findings of my work. Uh, but there are Tibetan hunters uh, that come over into the Bang Valley from the other side of the border. Um, and actually in one of the valleys of the northern part where the, where the wildlife sanctuary currently is, which will, if things go according to plans, the official plans, will be declared a tiger reserve. Um, there's one of the valleys that should have tigers but doesn't have any tigers because uh, local people believe that the Tibetans, when they come over looking for musk deer, they also shoot tigers. Uh, but, I mean, to, to actually respond to the question that was asked earlier by, by the the lady in the back. Um, the, I think the, the, the science, sort of the science and policy and belief system, and all, the scientific belief uh, system, and I think it's quite, um, you know, and it's, it's in the wrong place here because um, according to the surveys that I've done, um, if you declare that part, which is really big, a tiger reserve, uh, that can only actually host about six to seven, maybe nine adult tigers. Uh, and if you and the rest of the valley is where most of the animals live, so um, just have that in mind. Thought I'd add. Thank you very much, Shail, for a brilliant talk. <coughs> and uh, we owe some special thanks to a few people who made Shail's trip possible. Classic Travels, Rajiv, and Classic Travels, Jetwing, Wilpato Safari Camp, and Wild Coast Yalaf for providing accommodation while. Shail is in town. Can I call upon Sriyan to hand over a token of appreciation? Shail will be available after the talk outside. So please join us for tea, and you can continue your questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you.
Thank you very much for having me. You know that we've been working there hard to recreate that ecosystem. Uh, what you may like to know is that we now have five crocodiles in that area. So that's a good thing. It poses its own challenges, but the crocs are back. So there's little steps in progress and uh, exciting. So join us for tea. Sahil is out there. And 